think we're ready. Good. Right. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening. I must say I'm very, very chuffed. We've got two such. Um, the word eminent is always used before you say historian. And I think but it's it's used here correctly, um, dare I say it. So James Holland and Helen Fry, you're, you're two legends in your field. And uh, it's such a joy to have you both. And, uh, and well done, Helen, for having the book over your shoulder, um, which uh, Jane, James, you've let us down there. Where's your, where's your book? Have you got your copy? <laughs> well, I've got somewhere. I haven't got one of those, actually. <laughs> anyway, listen, uh, my name's Ben. I run the bookshop. Those of you who joined should probably mostly know me. I'm going to disappear shortly. Um, I'm going to be badgering you all for questions through the next um, 40 minutes. <laughs> And then I will put them to James and indeed Helen as well um, at the uh, uh, in the last sort of 20 minutes. But we will be finishing it at, at eight o'clock sharp. So thank you all for joining us. And let me hand over to uh, to Helen Fry. Thank you, Ben. And it's a pleasure to be interviewing James this evening. And I have to say a totally awesome book and deserving of all the praise. And particularly helpful, I found, not just the sheer number of photographs, which gives you such a visual to the book, but also the appendices and the, the maps and stuff at the beginning. It's absolutely brilliant and, you know, very lucid writing. I'm really engaged in it. So, James, thank you. Oh, thank and, you, Helen. Uh, no, seriously, because Italy, it's, it's Sicily and Italy, both on a tricky subjects. And I just yeah. wanted to say, to quote you, uh, you said that what faced the Allies with the invasion of Sicily was, to quote you, if that's okay, an extremely daunting challenge. So can you just kind of paint a little bit of the backdrop just in the run up to that? And of course, with the defeat in North Africa in July. Yes. So, um, so the problem is, is, is the kind of bigger picture it is, is that, by the sort of middle of, of, you know, first half of 1943, you know, the tide is definitely turned, you know, the, the Germans are going to be the, beaten, the Axis forces are going to be beaten. That, that, that's clear, but how long it's going to take and what form it's going to take is, the, these are the uncertainties. And, and, and what has been agreed in the Casablanca conference, and uh, which is obviously held in Casablanca between Churchill, uh, British Prime Minister, um, President Roosevelt of the USA and their respective Chiefs of Staff, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, that kind of sort of sat, got together to kind of sort of map out what kind of future strategy is going to be. What are they going to do? And the original plan was actually when the Americans joined the war in December 1941 was to go into and uh, do a cross channel invasion in 1942. And no sooner do they get over and that sort of becomes just impossible, you know, and they mm. realize that that's not going to happen. So then Churchill managed to persuade Roosevelt and subsequently the Chief of Staff that um, it would be good to have a joint. Uh, Anglo-US invasion of Northwest Africa, so that the British Eighth Army could could um, attack the um, uh, Rommel's Field Marshal Rommel's forces from Egypt, move westwards all across Libya into southern Tunisia, while uh, at the same time um, the Anglo-US First Army could land in Northwest um, Northwest Africa in Algeria um, and um, Morocco then also moved towards Tunisia and they could catch them in a pincer. So uh, that also kind of then knocks out kind of um, the opportunity of going into uh, north, uh, across the channel in 1943 as mm -hmm. well. <clears throat> but you've got to have this, you know, the, the, the Tunisia campaign is going to come to an end at some point. This is from the Casablanca conference point of view in January 1943. They've also got to think about shipping or the rest of it, so they need to kind of wrap up the Battle of the Atlantic pretty quickly, because the problem with the Battle of the Atlantic is until you know exactly how much shipping is coming your way, you mm. can't really plan for major operations. You need to know that kind of 98% of your shipping is going to get through if you're going to do that kind of planning. So one of the one of the results of, of the Casablanca Conference is, is, is a constant and focus on the Battle of the Atlantic and winning that once and for all. Second thing is, OK, so we're not going to probably get into across the channel in 1943, but we've got to do it in 1944. In May 1944 is the original plan, and we're not going to budge from that. Uh, um, but once we've done the, the Tunisia campaign, once that's over, then what do we do? Because we, mm. by that stage, we're going to have these vast armed forces, huge navies, air, you know, some three and a half thousand aircraft in the theatre, you know, a whole uh, two armies worth of of allied troops, more troops coming on their way. You know, what are we going to do with this? Uh, and, and it is recognised that there is a, 
there is a really strong case for going into Sicily because that's mm. on the other side of the Mediterranean. You know, you've wrapped it up in North Africa, but actually, if you go into Sicily, then you've got uh, that's a that's a first foothold in in fortress Europe. Um, you're going to uh, give yourself a better chance of bringing down Mussolini and with it fascism yes. and, Italy, and with it Italy's part of the war, and that then is a real. Uh, a problem for the Germans because what do they do? Do they either relinquish all that territory or do they occupy it themselves? Because, you know, when, when Italy's out of the war, it's not just Italy that's going, it's also Italian troops throughout the Aegean, Greece, the mm -hmm. Balkans, and, and either you relinquish that or you've got to fill those holes as well. And that means occupying Leros and Rhodes and, and, and Catalonia, of course, and as well as Greece and the Balkans and blah, blah, blah. And, and of course, the peninsula of Italy itself. And those troops have got to come from somewhere. So they could come from the Western Front and mm -hmm. weaken that, or they could come from the Eastern Front. Who cares? But, you know, conservatively, it's going to be, you know, tens of divisions worth of men, which is a big hit. So there's suddenly there's very good reasons to launch another major operation in the Mediterranean theatre in the summer of 1943, once the Tunisia campaign is over. The problem is that after the, you know, in January 1943, when all this is being decided, the Tunisia campaign isn't over. And in actual mm. fact, there's quite a major setback in February 1943. This is the Kasserine Pass where Rommel does a big, big thrust and the Americans, the, the one core of Americans that are involved, two core, US two core, are sent backwards and all the rest of it. Meanwhile, all the major commanders have got their hands full with the Tunisia campaign, but also at the same time are being expected mm. to plan for an invasion of Sicily with all the complexities of such a major amphibious operation. Because although although Torch is a kind of sort of good operation, Torch, which is the invasion of Northwest Africa, is a good sort of forerunner. It's it's not, you know, it's a done deal really before it happens. You know, it has been agreed that the French, fishy French forces aren't going to put up much of a fight. They're not in a position to put up much of a fight anyway. There's no, not, not many defences. It's not going to be that much of a tough nut, blah, blah, blah. But Sicily is completely unknown. So yeah. you're to plan for something when you have not the faintest idea what the strength of the opposition is going to be. And that is why it's such a big challenge. And you've got to get all those forces. You've got to you've got to coordinate air forces, naval forces, mm. land forces. You've got to kind of second guess what the enemy is going to do and what the response is going to be. And you've got to make sure, above all, that it's not a failure. Because this is the one thing that 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 historians and, and, and observers, when they're looking back at these amphibious operations that take place in the Second World War. What they're not taking into account, they're kind of there's an awful lot of sort of wisdom after the event. But at the time, your number one priority when you're launching an amphibious invasion of this scale of magnitude mm. is that it doesn't fail. <laughs> that and yeah, everything. So, so I was gonna, sorry, yes. Oh, go on, no, something you could say. There was a slight delay. I think that's the thing with technology, isn't it? When we're not in the same room, wow. and I guess listeners will be familiar of course so we can't bypass sicily without mentioning i'll get it out of the way operation mincemeat but yes. of course in your book you do have something on operation mincemeat that's deception but it wasn't the only one and i was intrigued by that so do you want to say something about that yes so there's a whole load of um deception plans going on for for, for sicily before it and sicily is called operation husky incidentally and, mm. and and the final plan gets signed off on the 3rd of may 1943 and all Axis forces surrender in Tunisia on the 13th of May so 10 days later so the plan is accepted and agreed before the Tunisia campaign is finished and when they have no idea what's going on which is why deception plans are are considered to be a really big important part of it so there's some some 40 sabotage operations in Greece I mean the overall thing what they're trying to do is suggest that they're going to do use possibly Sardinia as a stepping yeah. stone before they go to Greece don't quite see how geographically that works but that's the plan and, and it is they want the Axis forces, uh, and the Germans particularly, to assume that it is Greece that is the main target. So all these operate, you know, there's bridges being blown up and railway lines destroyed and all sorts of things going on in Greece at the same time as, as Operation Mincemeat has been launched. And Operation Mincemeat, just for in case there's, there's one person who's listening today who doesn't actually know what it is, it, it was this idea that you would get this down and out, you'd, 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 uh, who died, 
uh, and dress up his body as a as a phantom kind of um, Royal Marines officer, and about his person would be um, a, a kind of sort of a, a phony kind of plan of operations for a, 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 an Allied assault on Sardinia and Greece. He his body would be discarded by from a from a from a submarine in the Mediterranean, fairly close to the Spanish coast. It was supposed to look like he'd crashed in an aircraft. His body would then be uh, washed up on the shores. The Spanish um, fascist would pick it and then pass it, pick up the body and then find the documents and pass them on to Germany. And all this came to pass. So it did happen. It all ran very, very smoothly and according to plan. The only issue about it is really is is that the only person who thought that there was going to be an um, uh, an Axis invade um, an Allied invasion of Greece um, was Hitler. Um, and he already thought that anyway. Um, mm. So mincemeat confirms what Hitler already believes, but doesn't sway anyone who thinks it's going to be Sicily. And the bottom line is, is it can only really be Sicily because you cannot do an amphibious invasion unless you've got air superiority and air cover over the invasion front. And yes. the only place you can realistically do that in the Mediterranean, operating from North Africa and Malta, is Sicily. Sardinia, yes. just, but it's such a stretch. Why would you? Uh, and obviously the strategic benefits of taking Sicily are so great. I mean, it is impossible for, for it would have been impossible for the Allies to launch an amphibious invasion of Greece. What I like about your book actually is that you're laying foundations which are going to be so new to most people who, you know, I just think it is sad that the Sicily campaign isn't as well known as D-Day. Of course, it's there in the background, but of yeah. course you compare it to laying the foundations for, for D-Day actually and being, well, as significant, isn't it? Because they're landing more forces well, this in is Sicily, said, potentially. Yeah, so this is one of the byproducts of, of, of the planning. Uh, and there's two really interesting things that happen. The first thing is, is that um, Eighth Army come up against the Italians at Fideville, which is just south of Tunis. Um, you know, 50 miles or so south of Tunis. And they hit a brick wall and they can't get through. And mm -hmm. Montgomery, who's commander of 8th Army at the time, thinks, well, oh, okay, these, these Italians are actually pretty good troops. Now, what happens if they're pretty good troops on Sicily? What happens mm -hmm. when, because uh, what he's noticed is the Italian troops get better the closer they get to Italy. So the f further north in Tunisia, the closer as the crow flies they are to Sicily and to Italy. And he thinks they're getting tougher. So his worry is, what if we get to Sicily itself? And because it's Italian ground, they actually fight really tenaciously and really hard. Now, the reality is that the only reason the Italians are fighting well in Tunisia is through battle experience. They yeah. basically, you know, because their training is awful. Their kind of officer class is how officers are, 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 are brought into being and trained and all the rest of it is terrible. Uh, um, and it's only through experience, combat experience in North African campaign that you have this cadre of really good people who know what they're doing. So they've, they've learned the hard way. So those people don't actually exist in Sicily. But the Allies don't know that. And the yeah. point is, is that they can suspect that the Sicilian defenders in Sicily won't be up to much and that the Italian divisions in Sicily won't be up to much. But what if they're wrong? You yeah. Know, what if they do oh, fight as well yeah. as they, they fought Absolutely. at Pedeville and the Wadi Akaret and other places? You know, then, you, then you've got a real problem on your hand. So part of the planning is to concentration of force, of course, and to focus all the, all the um, both American and British and Canadian troops in the southeast of the island, mm. with the British taking the, taking the kind of the closest route to Messina. Messina is in the northeast of the island, and that is where it's kind of narrowest and, and where it's almost attached to the boot of boot of Italy. So once you've got Messina, you've got the island effectively because mm. you're, that is your link to Italy and you're cutting off the enemy's lines of communication at that point. So they land in the southeast and the, and the idea is that the A farmer will just swan straight up past Catania, up the coast, straight to Messina, job done. And the Americans on their kind of left flank will just support them. That's the kind of sort of best case scenario. But just in case it's really tough fighting, Montgomery wants an awful lot of fire support, but he also wants a lot of infantry on the ground, boots on the ground, mm. overwhelm the enemy defences. Yeah. And actually, that's an incredibly sensible decision. If your start point is this amphibious invasion cannot be allowed to fail, because you just think what that means. If, if you're kicked back into the sea, oh, yeah, it sets back everything. 
probably sets back Normandy. You know, it sets back the kind mm. of final invasion. It had the, the knock-on effects of the failure of, of, a, of a, you know, with all that entails, so the kind of effects to morale, the psychological blow, the kind of logistics of it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it is just absolutely unthinkable. So that trumps up everything. The problem is, is that actually the Sicilian defences are useless, uh, absolutely hopeless, and they basically all run away. So Montgomery has completely overcompensated. And he's got all those troops on the ground, 160,000 that have been landed in the first 24 hours, at a price. And the price is motorised transport, because you can't have yeah. everything. You've only got X number of ships. And, 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 the, and, the, and the naval forces that are supporting Husky are considerably less than they are at Normandy just, every, just under a year later. So it's there's still impressive. 7,000 vessels at Normandy, yeah. but only about 2,600 at, at for Husky. But I think you still get a sense in the book that this is impressive. You know, there is a focus on air superiority yes, and of course absolutely. harnessing the naval uh, power, yes. which you make really clear. Yeah. So what what did they in reality face? Because of course it was an incredibly challenging situation that wasn't in the landing with potentially being, well, as you say, in some cases landing in slightly the wrong place and not quite in the sheer yeah. cliff edges that they've got to mount. I'll just read something. Just I've got one quote from your book. I'm just hell bent on quoting you this evening, Jeff. Right. I don't normally, right. but you've got some fantastic stuff in here. Um, yeah, it's Eisenhower's naval aide, Harry Butcher, Yes. Who says, as a brilliant quote, to be sending 150,000 men on a highly dangerous landing on an enemy coast, highly fortified, uh, with mines in the water and on land, uh, shore batteries and U boats, etc. Worst of all, the air bases we can have at fighter bombers, etc. I mean, it's a hell of a, you know, I think you just get a sense that God, this was a hell of an operation. So how did they do, you know, how did they succeed? Well, it is a hell of an operation when you consider that, that at the point that Butcher is ma making that, that comment in his diary and noting that, that is when it's, it's just completely unknown. They have no mm. idea what the defence is going to be. Well, they've got an idea, they've got an inkling, they've got a kind of, you know, supposition. But, you, you know, they haven't got loads of agents swarming over the place kind of sort of uh, um, reporting back or anything like that. No. So, you know, you can take aerial photographs and you can do that, but it's, it's not... The same as it is for you know the intelligence picture is nothing like as clear as it is for normandy 11 yeah. months later and so yeah so it, it, it is really challenging i mean but but as it turns out the coastal divisions these sicilian coastal divisions are under equipped under trained and uh, and and not motivated i mean what, what is absolutely clear is that with the end of the campaign in sicily italy is broken you know mm. that it, it is finished. It's 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 you know it's in its death death gasps as a as a kind of fighting force. And while they fought very tenaciously in Tunisia, once that once that's over and done and dusted, and all those incredibly experienced men are in the bag, you know they're all POWs mm. by, by, at the end of the Tunisia campaign. I mean, quarter of a million men taken in at the end of Tunisia. It, the, Italian will just goes, you know, it, it's been on the on the decline for a long time and the leadership's just gone. It's just shot. You know, Mussolini's grip on power is, is shot. Yeah. Um, and so the whole thing is just imploding. So all these Sicilians are just thinking, why am I fighting anymore? What's the point? You know, and, and lots of Sicilians have got connections with America as well. You know, mm. massive migration of Sicilians, over a million people, two million people, uh, no, million, 1.3 million migrate in the kind of first decade of the 20th century to America from Sicily. It's a hell of a lot. You know, so you've got all those connections and stuff and the will's just not there. And so actually, from the coastal point of view, it's, it's a bit of a kind of walk in the park. Mm. And it turns out that Monty was overcautious. But you didn't know that beforehand. That's my point. And it's always better to be yeah. conscious than it is to be reckless. The problem is because they then don't have the motorised transport, the men have got to kind of move inland on foot for the most yes. part. And that's really tough. And, and, and it's broilingly hot. I, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a Baydecker guide, which is the sort of classic travel guides hmm. from before the war. And it says, whatever happens, don't, visit, don't even think about visiting Sicily in July or August. It's absolutely, you know, which is exactly the two months where the campaign is fought. It is boiling hot. And you kind of, we all know how much metal conducts heat. 
Mm. And I imagine, you know, it's a, it's it's 105 degrees or whatever it is, you know, Fahrenheit, whatever that is. That's like 30, 37, 8 degrees Celsius, isn't it? And and you're wearing a tin hat. Uh, and, you know, they say it's like, it's like putting your head in an oven. I mean, it's just, it's so uncomfortable. And, and, and you're having to trudge, you know, 50, 60, 70 miles northwards. You know, it takes time. There's not yeah. enough water. You know, and the infrastructure in Sicily is really backward. It's, it, it has barely changed in kind of 300 years. So most of the roads aren't tar uh, Um There isn't widespread, you know, electrical network. There isn't running water in a lot of the, I mean, there is in the main cities, but not in the kind of small towns. And in the provinces, you know, so, so where do you get this water from? And if you do take it, you know, you're going to get dysentery or, or whatever. So if you get it from mm. wells. So, you know, it's, it's not a good place in which to fight. And so this enables the Germans, there's two German divisions on, on Sicily to start off with. This enables them to kind of regain their balance. You know, they've, they've read the Allied intentions completely wrong. They've got a, a division over in the western side of the, of, the, of the island, which is a completely wrong place for it. They've got the wrong mm. division at the centre of the island. But they've got enough forces to be able to do delaying actions on the British as they're kind of moving up the kind of east, east coast. And, and that just slows them up combined with the heat and the dust and the kind of lack of water and all the rest of it, and then general exhaustion. And at the same time, they're able to reinforce with more divisions. So the first Fauschenberger division arrives, for example, which is really good troops. I mean, they're really, mm. really good. They're all battle-hardened, experienced, well-trained, motivated, all those kind of things. They'll come in and, and they start to be able to make a defensive line, uh, an ad hoc defensive line. And Sicily really, really favours the defender. You know, uh, and, and yes, you say people that. Mount yeah. Etna are in the northeast of the island, which dominates the entire island, a bit like sort of Sauron's eye from Lord of the Rings. And in the foothills of that, you've got you can put your observers and you can put your guns and your artillery and all the rest of it. And they have eyes on the Catania Plain, which is one of the very few flat bits in, in Sicily, across which Eighth Army is trying to pass. Uh, uh, and, and elsewhere, there's lots of hills and mountains of which there are towns on the top of them. And there's usually one road going up the, up the hill and mountain mm. and another one going down the other. And, and the only way the Allies can take these mountaintop towns is just by slogging their way up them, you know, by yeah. kind of sheer brute force and dogged determination and all the rest of it. And so they have to prize these hilltop towns one after the other. And it just gets absolutely brutal, you know, and the heat and the dust mm. and the flies and the mosquitoes and the malaria and, you know, on top of dogged German defence with machine guns and mortars and artillery, you can see why it starts to take a bit of a, it's a it turns into a bit of a slogging match room. I mean, it takes in the end, doesn't it, about five weeks? Yes, 38 days is how long it takes. I mean, given the challenges that they faced, I think it's, it's amazing. Don't you think that they, they did succeed in that time span? Given yeah, the I think challenges. it's really good. I mean, it's very interesting. I've done quite a few battle tours of Sicily with, with the British Army. And it's really interesting. And at the end of the battlefield tour, you know, you're standing at the top of Tenterepe or you're kind of overlooking the Straits of Messina and you kind of do your sort of concluding marks. Uh, and to a man, everyone goes, 38 days to take this place. That is an amazing effort. Is Whereas it? At, 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 immediately afterwards, there was this kind of sense that it had taken a little bit longer than they'd hoped. Uh, and, and there was a sort of slight sense of disappointment, largely because of the number of Axis troops that managed to escape across the Straits of Messina. Uh, um, and since then, subsequent historians have kind of really rubbished the, the, the British effort, uh, the, sorry, the Allied effort, the British mm. Canadian American effort, saying they were too slow, too cumbersome, too stodgy, you know, lacking drive, lacking imagination and all the rest of it. And I, I would just refute all of that. I mean, I just think yeah. it's really unfair. Because that's what I like about, you know, reading your book, the, the honesty of it, you know, and, and it, it's just so fresh. It's a fresh look at Sicily. Oh, thank um, you. No, absolutely brilliant. I was so bowled over. I really, really enjoyed it. Oh, and good. also, of course, this tricky, well, I don't know if it's tricky relationship between Germany and Italy, because again, you, you highlight how, the, how Germany, how Hitler had complete contempt, really, yeah. didn't he? For the yes, people who were poverty stricken. 
I mean, the relationship between the two allies has completely broken down. I mean, it is very interesting when you consider that Britain, Britain and America are not allies, they're coalition partners, although they're ironically or paradoxically called the allies, whereas the real allies are, are Italy and Germany, and they absolutely hate each other's guts. And, and the kind of, there is nothing but contempt from the Germans for the Italians, who they just see as feckless, running away, useless, you know, Mediterranean kind of lover boys. And, and at the top of the chain, it's just, I mean, you, you, you know, the, there's quite a lot of transcripts of Hitler's conferences. And the mm. language they're using is just, it's just, it's really hard to believe looking back on it now. I mean, it's pure art. I, well, I always knew they were complete foxes. I knew they were complete rats. You know, I always said that they were going to be kind of, you know, they were going to do the dirty on us. You know, you can't trust any of them. They're just, they're just playboys, all of them. They always just moan about the lack of supplies and yet they're always swanning it up drinking champagne in Rome. You know, it's all this kind of stuff. And it's just, it's, it's unbelievable, really. So the, that, that relationship is completely broken down. But curiously, there's this sort of, strange loyalty of Hitler towards Mussolini, uh, which is very yeah. odd. And so, you know, while Musso's kind of, still, you know, while Il Duce is still kind of in charge, Hitler will definitely go the kind of extra yards for him, but but Mussolini falls on the 25th of July and, and um, he's booted out. And an interesting thing about Mussolini as a fascist dictator is he's, he's never quite the complete totalitarian leader that, that Hitler is of Nazi Germany, for example. You know, there is still a king in Italy, it is the royal kingdom of Italy. You know, it is the royal air force, the royal navy, but just the Italian. Mm. You know, so um, it's it's it, it's kind of interesting. And so Mussolini does get overthrown. You know, it's it's that's him out. And at that point, it's clear it's kind of game up. Although actually, the Italians, the, the, one of the reasons why they've stayed in the war so long is they know that they're in this between a rock and a hard place. They they mm. made this. They, they've made this call of going, becoming an alliance, um, an ally of, of, of Nazi Germany. And now they're stuffed, you know, it, it's gone wrong. And, and what they're trying to do is get out of the war with the least amount of pain and bloodshed. And, and of course it goes horribly wrong. Um, and, and they do get out of the war on, on the 8th of September. And, you know, 18 months, pretty much 18 months later, you know, the war finally comes to an end in, in shattered war-torn Italy in May 1945. Um, but but that's another story. But you know, it's it's the only reason they keep fighting is they're kind of thinking, uh, you know, how can we get out of this? How can we get out of this easily? Uh, uh, and one of the, one of the things they're hoping for is that, is that Germany will come to their rescue again, and kind yeah. of you know prevent the Allies from landing in southern Italy. So they're kind of sort of hedging their bets a bit. So I, I wasn't going to kind of necessarily go into the battles themselves so I think people can read that in your book and I like the way that you carry the reader because I you know there's so much dense stuff there from your sources but you you tell it so brilliantly and the oh, human story of course a lot of eyewitness stuff so I just wanted to do some broad brushes actually with stuff which people won't read in the book sure. um and I said well you kind of do touch on it um I wanted to think in what sense do you think Sicily really did prepare the Allies for D-Day? Did it prepare? Do you think it prepared the Allies for D-Day? And in which case, what did they learn mm. in advance for D-Day? I think it's a really interesting connection which people don't often make. Well, Husky is, the, uh, is, is really the only amphibious operation that is even close to the scale of Normandy. Mm. So as a testing ground, it, it's it's very important and I think also that you, you you sense that the coalition of Britain and America is coming of age really with the end of the Tunisia campaign that they're starting to understand their way of war there is this sort of sense that up until that point really they've been sort of playing catch up trying to you know the British have the Americans are kind of very late to the show and very inexperienced at this point still but but I mean it's, it's, it's General later Field Marshal Alexander who used to says you know, in June 1943, says, you know, what what modern warfare is a brotherhood of air, land and sea. You know, the air, the army, the air forces and the navy all are, inter, you know, intimately linked and have to work with one another all the time. It's a constant sort of, you know, moving show, you know, the naval, you know, air forces are, are, are supporting what's going on on the ground. Uh, um, uh, and what's happening and offering protection for the naval forces. The naval forces are offering protection for the landing forces and the army uh, and providing supplies. Uh, and, and so it goes around in this sort of this circle all the time. Uh, and he's absolutely right about that. And I think it's, 
Sicily is a really important testing ground for those three services working together and the coalition working together. And what everyone sort of forgets is, is that, you know, Operation Husky, which was launched on the 10th of July 1943, that is the first time the US have put a field army into battle. Yes. In the war. Yeah. You know, they just haven't done anything on that scale before. And one of the most interesting things about it for, for a testing ground for 7th Army is it becomes, it only becomes 7th Army at midnight on the 9th, 10th of July. So just on the, uh, as it's about to go into battle, you know, for the invasion. It's later on between the, set, the, the 19th of, um, and the 23rd of July, they do this big clearing of the west and half of Sicily. And the opposition isn't great. There's it's mainly Italian troops, most of them who aren't really particularly interested, um, and a lot of them just throw down their arms. But that's missing the point of it, really, because mm. what it is is a is a massive testing ground for their operational level, and they do it with bells on. I mean, they, boy, do they do they deliver. So they just, I mean, just even if you've got no opposition, just sweep up half an army across a, an area half the size of Sicily is an incredible logistics feat yeah absolutely. Just, just keeping people surprised in water in food in, in petrol in, in in vehicles that work and all the rest of it i mean it's just it's an incredible incredible feat of arms really and that shouldn't be underestimated and that is a really good testing ground and that shows again that the americans are coming of age that they are now kind of ready for um for for, for what's to come in the rest of the war in terms of airborne operations, airborne operations are a complete fiasco. And so, you know, what you've got in Sicily is you've got among the best trained Allied troops being delivered by the least prepared, air, you know, uh, um, mm. Air Force troops, uh, Air Force, Air Forces. And, and that's got to be sorted out before D-Day. You know, otherwise it's going to be a complete fiasco. And it's already accepted that for Normandy, uh, um, airborne opera, you know, airborne troops and airborne operations are going to be a key part of it. So, so those are, are the major lessons, I think. And also, it's just about it's about coalition warfare. It's about operating together, two armies side by side, working together, you know, singing from the same hymn sheet. And they and they do that mm. absolutely brilliantly. You know, there's this is, you know, so much emphasis on the kind of sort of belly aching and the kind of sort of and, and the kind of international kind of rivalries and all the rest of it but i think actually a much better way of looking at it is to is to kind of celebrate just how successfully they did operate together when they were so new to it yeah and i think that really comes across in the book and it i wanted to ask you why you think it's the least understood campaign is it because it doesn't have the same media attention mm -hmm. as d-day um you know it's not widely written about is it no i mean the the last the last big big narrative history of the Sicilian campaign came out in 1987 so mm. you know you know that's what's, what's that that's yeah 30 30 odd years ago 33 years ago it's a long time um i i think because there hasn't been a film made about it you know i mean most of our under most of our real interest in in uh world war ii is dictated by movies i think yeah that's uh, true. and also proximity i mean it's just easier to go to you know Americans come over to London, they see London and go to Big Ben and, and kind of look at the cabinet war rooms and then they go to Normandy. Mm. Uh, um, and Normandy is just, you know, from ever since the longest day has just been absolutely enshrined in kind of, you know. That sort of big, the big story. Big story. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so you do that and yeah, I guess that's why really. So what... Um, this leads so overshadowed by what follows, I think. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So what myths do you think you've put to bed in your book? Because, of course, the the Wall Street Journal gave you a wonderful review and said, you know, you've put a few myths to bed. Yeah, so, um, I don't do you want to I mean, comment I, I on that? that? Well, I just think, you know, there's been so many, you know, so many of the major narrative historians are journalists. Journal journalists like discord because it gives them something kind of to be sparky about. And, you know, and people... You know, successive historians and journal historians have highlighted the kind of anglophobia and Americophobia of the senior commanders. Uh, and so we've got this incredible insight into what it's like being in the kind of, you know, headquarters of Eisenhower or Patton or Monty or whatever. Uh, um, but I think they've really overcooked that. I, and, and, you know, quotes have been taken uh, um, out of context. Um, they haven't been put in the wider context of the, these, these diaries that all these senior commanders seem to keep um i i just don't think there was an awful lot of friction really i think most people kind of got on pretty well and, and worked together pretty well so um 
I think the whole story about the race to Messina, the sort of mm. rivalry between Patton and, and Montgomery, I, I, it's just absolute nonsense. I mean, you know, that just comes out of the Patton film, the George G. Scott film of 1970, and, and it's, it's got no basis in truth. I mean, Patton's an interesting character because he's sort of a bit like Trump in, in that he's a complete egoist and narcissist, and 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 he's got a he's got to win at everything. You know, he's kind of hyper competitive. You know, he's he's not a loser; he's a winner. So yeah, him, it's all about him coming number one, and next off the peg is is the US coming number one. So it's him first, then it's the troops under his command, and it, and, and and this is this is something that Bradley, who's his core commander at the time, and Montgomery and Alexander just just don't think at all. They just don't think like that. I mean, Monty's obviously got a massive ego too, and he's also extremely competitive, but but. Montgomery just isn't involved in the race to Messina. He just doesn't see it like that. You know, it's just, it's it's a complete figment of Patton's mm. imagination and nothing more. Well, I just got an, one final question before we open up to the audience, because you've got that wonderful um, narrative at the end of your book when you took your daughter to oh, Sicily. Yeah. And I suppose, yeah, that, that was a wonderful touch, really, because I, I suppose as historians, we have to connect, don't we, to the places we're writing about. And I guess you are also, like myself, passionate about visiting the places you're researching. Isn't there a sense of place? And and Sicily, it, it meant something to you, didn't it? Yeah, it really did. It really, it, it really got under my skin, actually. There's something, mm. there's something sort of still quite kind of sort of harsh and brutal about, about Sicily. Even today, it's got some beautiful, beautiful parts to it, but 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 it's but it's harsh, it's raw. You know, you you, you can go to the edge of so much fly tipping in Sicily, you know, and you can go to the edge of Catania and on these sort of quiet factory roads, there's, there's loads of prostitutes just sort of, you know, loitering on sort of back roads in the country, kind of waiting to be picked up. And it, so there's this kind of sort of rough, kind of unattractive side to it, brutal side to it. And, and I think what what just you know, just moving around Sicily today in a kind of modern car, driving up to some of these hilltop towns, it's it's tough. It's quite hard work, you know, it really <laughs> is. So, you know, just imagine you're under fire and you've got to do it by foot or, you know, the heat of July and August. Um, and I think you're right. I think you do need to connect about with the places you, you, you're writing around because, because you want to convey to the reader as much as you possibly can this sense of what a place is like and the kind of, the sights and the sounds and the smells and, and, and the scale, you know, how does, you know, people, people are always talking about, you know, capture that ridge, take that hill, you know, that high point, they say, you know, we, we had to take this high point 22 or, or 103 or 684, you know, what does it mean? You know, and, and obviously we know that 22 is basically kind of sort of 20 metres off the off feet off the ground or whatever, but but and tiny, but but I do think you need to go there to, to see really, you know, what does a mountain top hill look? <coughs> excuse me. What does a mountain top hill look like? Is it really a mountain? I mean, is it a mountain as in the Alps or 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 Snowdon or Scarfell Pike, or is it a mountain as in you know quite a large hill? I mean, do you know what I mean? I mean, and it's until you've been there, you can't tell that. And you need to smell the the flowers and the dried grass, mm. see the fly tipping, and the kind of sense of scale and where everything fits and connects to one another to be able to write about it convincingly. I think. So we're going to hand back to Ben. Yeah, no, don't go anywhere, Helen. That's all right. I'm. Um, uh, how, what a lovely conversation you, you two have been having. It's brilliant. Um, so no, I've got uh, a, a small collection of uh, questions. Do send any more in, guys, if you're um, those of you watching. Um, Stephen, Stephen asks a lovely question. Jay, uh, Jane's wonderful, enthusiastic talk. I'm slightly surprised that you appear to underplay the importance of Operation Mincemeat. Uh, <laughs> He said it did force the gun Germans to move motorized tank divisions to Greece. Uh, yes, and move, move, but this was all part of Operation Axis, which was what happens if Italy goes out of the war. Um, uh, and that was on Hitler's orders, uh, and Hitler would have done it anyway because he was convinced they were going to go into Greece. So I, I would slightly refute that. Um, the point is, as, as I said earlier on, mincemeat doesn't persuade those who think it's going to be sicily and it doesn't it doesn't make any difference to what hill is already thinking 
Hitler is already preparing to send in troops to Italy and throughout the Balkans. So the armoured division that goes into northern Greece is, is that's already part of the plan anyway. And um, Stephen then extends his question to, um, he's, he's intrigued by, uh, and can you describe, explain the relationship between Patton and Montgomery a little bit more? Yeah, they kind of brushed each other. They didn't really like each other very much. Uh, but Patton tended not to like a lot of people and, and ditto Monty. I mean, Monty just had this kind of very great self-assurance. I think Patton sort of similarly, but also was racked by doubt. So, so he had a kind of public uh, face, which was extremely, supremely confident, um, less so to his personal diary. Um, which is sort of, you know, the, the, I mean, the, the diaries these guys keep is sort of a bit like, you know, your psychiatrist that you would go and visit. It's kind of letting off steam. It's kind of, you know, it's a lonely business, high command. Um, and it's a means of sort of letting off steam. So I do think kind of you have to be a little bit careful about how you treat what someone says on a Tuesday night in a fit of peak. You know, you have to look at what they're also saying on Thursday and, and following Tuesday and, you know, and, and look at it in the round. Um, they're both very sort of brittle characters. They're both, um, they both love media attention. They are both egocentric and, and narcissistic and all those sort of things. Um, Montgomery does have vast experience by this point and Patton doesn't, you know, because you've got, this is the first time a, a, a field army has been put into combat. You know, this is new for everybody in the Second World War from the American point of view. Uh, and, you know, one has to be very careful not to conflate the pattern of 1945, you know, the triumphant general and commander of, of, of U.S. Third Army with who he is on the eve of Husky and, and even by the end of, of the Sicilian campaign, where he's still he's learning and learning fast, but but he's new to this level of warfare. And he is a driver and um, he's, he's a very tough commander. And there's lots of good things about him. But, you know. He's a tricky character uh, and, and, you know, and exhorting all your troops before the invasion to not take any prisoners and shoot the son of the bitches and all this sort of stuff. You know, that does indirectly lead to kind of uh, um, several massacres by US troops of Italians and Germans on, on Sicily, you know, and, and it's sort of, you know, the whole slapping thing at the end of the campaign is kind of quite weird. I did see, uh, I saw you did a, um, a presentation to the American Army Association or something. It was... Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, it was, it was it was the one most recent recorded um, piece I could see about your um, on, about this book, actually, um, prior to us doing this one. I, you've probably done others, but I couldn't find them. And how, how what's the feedback you got from Amer an American audience? Yeah, no, I think that I mean, I spoke to Americans a lot. And, you know, this this is I mean, the, the thesis that I'm putting forward in Sicily is part of a, a consistent thesis that I put out of, about the whole of the Second World War that, you know, by 1945, the American armed forces were the best in the world, bar none. You know, but but in 1943, they're new to it, and you, you know, this is this is my point. You've got to kind of make sure that you're you're looking when you're when you're judging their performance in 1943. You've got to judge it as it was in 1943, not as they become. You know, you you can't look at look at it through a, a retrospective lens in a way. Mm. Uh, you can obviously because you've got more. You know, you're looking at it through the point of view of all the your information, but you've got to judge them on what they are at that particular time, uh, that that place in time. Uh, and most Americans are kind of, um, I find find pretty pretty open to it because you know I'm incredibly complimentary about the Americans. I think the Americans were absolutely amazing in the Second World War, mm. uh, um, and they developed some very good commanders. I think the kind of the slow, methodical, broad broad front. Um, approach that they develop in in 1944 1945 both in Italy and in um, and in Northwest Europe I think was the correct way to deal with it to be perfectly honest um, you know I just I just I, I think tactically Patton is is uh, better than the Montgomery I think Mont Montgomery is a very very good operational commander and a very good strategic commander I don't think he's particularly brilliant to tactically at all I don't think he's very imaginative like that um, but I don't think that's what you need with, with allied armies, you know, where you've got so much material heavy. It's what I call big war. So it's a very long tail uh, you've got, which is sort of, you know, the, the whole point is to try and keep frontline ca casualties of those at the absolute cold face, which is primarily um, uh, infantry and armour, 
uh, above all, or obviously artillery as well and engineers and so on, but primarily infantry and armour, to keep casualties to an absolute bare minimum, keep the numbers to a bare minimum. And you can only do that by having an incredibly strong backup system of supplies um, and, and using steel, not flesh, to do a lot, of the, a lot of your hard years. So an awful lot of emphasis on air power, on naval power, uh, on kind of machinery to do a lot of your hard yards. Um, and I think that was absolutely the right approach. Lovely, lovely. Um, how important was the invasion of Sicily uh, to the outcome of World War Two? I mean, I had a long chat with John Nicholl uh, about Lancaster uh, and, and the uh, the importance of uh, Lancaster bombing, which actually I... I, I have you, I've got, I went from a no knowledge at all to uh, to suddenly just the realization just how important the bombing had been. I know there's arguments that it was completely over the top on in certain aspects, but um, well, no, I'm completely with John on this. I mean, I think strategic air campaign was was, was the right way to go. I mean, the whole point, mm -hmm. what, you know, what, what what you're trying to do as a, as a as a sovereign nation is um, try and win the war as quickly as possible for the least amount of casualties all round, but particularly to your own nationals mm. you know and, and and there's no question that the strategic air campaign definitely contributed to that i mean you know no one would deny that britain or america didn't play a huge part in the war and yet their casualty figures are a fraction of what all the other major competents are and that's because they were fighting a much more efficient war and strategic air bombing is part of that mm -hmm. and, and as the war progressed it became ever more efficient um i mean you know the Allies were always incredibly clear to Nazi Germany. You know, if you want the bombing to stop, stop the war. You know, surrender. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, I mean, this is what, what sort of, you know, German apologists say. They say, you know, OK, so the Germans had the Holocaust, but, you know, so did the, so did the British Americans because they were bombing and killing civilians in cities. And the difference is, of course, is that had the war not ended in the way it did, the Germans would have continued with the Holocaust and eradicating millions of people. Whereas the moment the war ended, we stopped bombing them. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary, really. I mean, usually wars end because um, one side recognises that it's not going to win and it's run out of money, uh, which is exactly what happens in 1918 with the, you know, with the central powers um, and finally surrendering in, in, in November 1918. But by that token, you know, Hitler should have given up throwing in the towel probably in November 1941. But he doesn't. He just keeps fighting because Hitler is a black and white kind of guy, and it's all or nothing. It's it's kind of it's the Thousand Year Reich or it's Armageddon. There is no there is no grey area and there is no middle ground. So he just keeps going. So from that point onwards, it's not a question of who's going to win the war. It's a question of how quickly can the Allies defeat Nazi Germany, and how many casualties are there going to be at the end of it, and how can they defeat Nazi Germany with the least amount of casualties to their own men? So one of the ways of doing it is supplying the Russians so that they can fight more effectively mm -hmm. and they can kill their own men so you don't have to kill your own. I mean, it's cynical and it's hard, but there's a kind of logic to it. Mm -hmm. and, and bombing is part of that, you know, because obviously if you're flattening cities, that's not helpful if you, as in Nazi Germany, are trying to kind of, you know, produce more armaments and, and try and conduct your war because... Your cities are your big nodal points. That's where your marshalling yards are. That's where your railways is. That's where your factories are and all the rest of it. And that's where your population is. So if all those are kind of blocked and, and stopped and, you know, and prevented from functioning properly, that is going to have an adverse effect on your war. And there is no question about it that, that you know, economically, the war is lost in the West. In terms of boots on the ground, it's lost in the East. But in terms of economics, it's hundred percent lost in the in the West, and that is largely because of area bombing. Mm. Uh, okay, this is um, I suppose the question about how it, it, it important Sicily was in that whole ream of things. Oh yes, that was the question, wasn't it? Sorry, we got into a bit of peace, but I, um, yeah. Uh, yes, well, I, you know, Sicily is part of the whole thing. I mean, it, it's it's a series of stepping stones. It's like a, it's like a big ladder. You know, to to win the war, you've got to get to the top rung. Um, and, and it's, a, it's another step up that ladder yeah. um, uh, um, to get to that point. I mean, the knock on benefits of going into Sicily is one, you know, Italy is out of the war. So that's that sorted. So that does draw in 50 German divisions into Italy and the Balkans and, and, the, and, and the Aegean and Greece, um, which is no small number. Um, it gets the Allies a foothold. They learn valuable lessons for Normandy the following year. Um, you know, 
in the big scheme of things, it's pretty important. Oh, you know, and there, there is no substitute for experience. You can train all you like, but 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 experience, both at the bottom, at the at the micro level, and at the macro, the highest level, the command level, all of which is is really important. So strategically, operationally, and tactically, an operation of of, of Sicily scale, Operation Husky scale is is really really important because it shows at a strategic level the high command can operate together it shows that 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 combined services uh, um operations can work um so that's a strategic level operationally it shows that you can do something on that scale and pull it off and, and at the tactical level it shows that you know we've got the troops and the and the equipment and the weaponry to be able to deliver victory Good. This is a question that perhaps could be put to both of you, actually. Um, you're pr primarily historians who have written about individual aspects of World War II. You invest a lot of yourself and your time to document these events. Um, do you write for yourself as passionate historians or for us as book readers? <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I definitely write. I, I definitely write for myself. I mean, I, I, I write with a kind of sort of, you know, obviously I'm not going to write something that there, there might be something that I'd really like to write, but it's not going to sell. So I'm not going to write it. Um, um, but when I'm writing it, I am infused, excited, completely sucked and drawn into the whole thing. I mean, you know, you're, you're dealing with epic levels of human drama, uh, which is why we watch soap operas, isn't it? And watch dramas on television and all the rest of it and read books because we're we're interested in other people's lives. So you've got this amazing human drama that uh, uh, you can't really beat that. Um, and I love the kind of detective work. I love the kind of investigation of kind of learning stuff and finding out and getting to the bottom of something. You know, I mean, I've, I was just explaining to you, to, to you, Ben, and to Helen earlier on that I've been spending the afternoon trying to work out sort of arcane details about kind of 50 divisions um, um, assault of Gold Beach on D-Day. Um, and, and it's been really frustrating, but really fun as well. So, yeah, I've def definitely I do, it, I do it for myself. I'm sure you would agree with me, Helen. Yeah, I think for me, it has been a journey. I started off, I don't know, 20 something years ago in quite a small way when I was bringing up the family. So it's kind of keeping the brain cells active. But yeah, telling stories which needed to be told. But if I look back on my career, weren't commercial. So I didn't do it for the commercial side. But you kind of fall into other areas and, and building. And I suppose, yeah, when I write now, I enjoy the research like James does. But I do have, when I'm writing it, an eye to the audience to try and connect the stories. But then you see, I write about spies, espionage and intelligence. And of course, that's quite big in people's imaginations, quite rightly, I guess. Um, so the stories are different and they're easier in many ways, to, I think, to connect. So I think perhaps you're more conscious there in writing for the audience, in looking at the sources, what stories will they really enjoy? So if I'm chuckling, some of the stories in the archives I think yeah the reader will enjoy this if I enjoy it then they will too so I think yeah it's been a bit of a journey like that for me nice nice and um, in terms of in fact there's one more um, there's one more question that I need to do which is on on, on brand on Sicily um, Stephen's doing the right thing and bringing us back to uh, what we should be talking about um, with the taking of Sicily did German U-boat activity in the Mediterranean cap capitulate, or did it carry on? Do you know? Uh, say, say again, Ben. With the taking of Sicily, did German U-boat activity in the Mediterranean capitulate? Yeah, that was it. There was no. That was it. Pretty much, yeah. Not entirely, but pretty much. What? Where? Where? Where else did they have U-boat sort of um, bases? Well, they still had them in the Atlantic, but but they were basically drawn in for kind of shorter term stuff. You know, closer to closer to the shore. I mean, you know, we were, they were just too easy to detect. The problem is, is, is in the Mediterranean, particularly with U-boats, is, is they can usually be seen from, from the air. The, the water's clear enough, the light is clear enough, mm -hmm. that you can actually see, because of the lack of cloud, um, that you can actually see U-boats under the surface. You know, it's a bit, I mean, you, you, we've all seen those photos, haven't we, of kind of sort of, you know, a blue world of, of whales, and you see them from above, and they're, and they're under the surface, and you can see them. It's kind of the same thing. I mean, U-boats generally don't, don't, you know, are not, are generally moving around on the surface. They're, most U-boats in the Second World War are not what we would call submarines, they're submersible. So they can submerge for a certain short period. Right. The moment they do, they go to kind of walking pace and they can't stay down there for very long. So 
they need to operate on the surface and on the surface is just too risky. Yeah. That's because of all the allied air power that's going back and forth. Good. So um, we, in the last um, two or three minutes we've got, um, what, you, know, you gave a little hint of what you're working on, James. Tell us, uh, tell us about it. Yeah, no, I'm having a really, really nice time, actually. I'm doing, I was supposed to be doing War in the West Volume 3, but I can't get to get to the archives I need to at the moment for obvious reasons. Um, so I'm doing a, a book where I could get, get my archive work, my primary sources, without any problem. And it's going to be called Brothers in Arms, and it's following the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry from D-Day to V-Day. day so, so think Band of Brothers, British tanks. Um, it's that kind of thing, and it's very heavy on human drama. It's, it's very nice to not have to do something in 360 degrees, all sides for once. Um, and I'm trying to get as close as we possibly can to what it was like being in an armoured regiment in 1944, 1945. Um, and the long and short of it, it was absolutely brutal. I mean, completely brutal. Um, and the, the wonderful thing about the Sherwood Rangers is because they were uh, a yeomanry regiment, i.e. part of the Territorial Army, effectively, they're kind of, you know, they don't have that kind of sort of whole sort of standing on regimental ceremony. They're not quite a spick and span. They attract mavericks and eccentrics. Um, they are generally people who would not have been fighting. You know, they had other lives had it not been for the war. Um, and I suppose to a certain extent you can say that of all, all kind of, you know, army units by this stage of the war. But they're a very colourful bunch of people. Uh, and there's there's a lot of absolutely heartbreaking tragedy, but there's also lots of funny moments too. And there is a huge amount of human drama. Uh, and, you know, it goes through, you know, I'm dividing it into four parts, summer, autumn, winter and spring. And you really feel those seasons when you're kind of following a tank crew, I can promise you. And it's just been fascinating. So I'm, I'm really enjoying that. It'll be a, a much shorter book than Normandy or Sicily. You know, it won't be a kind of massive great doorstopper. Um, and it's a real pleasure to write. It's a, it's a privilege to write, actually, to kind of sort of put flesh back mm. onto the bones of some of these characters who, most of whom are, um, nearly all of whom are, are, are long dead. But um, Is there anyone you've been able to interview? Yeah, yeah. No, and I interviewed a, a number of them a few years ago. Um, but yeah, there's only one, actually, that who's still alive that I, that I interviewed that, that, I, that is sort of, you know, capable of, of sitting down and having a kind of coherent conversation. So, yeah, you know, that, and that's, that's kind of sad and traumatic in a way. You know, that generation's just slipping away very quickly. It is, isn't it? I know um, John um, Nickel, I think he interviewed 20 people for his book and only three are left now for the Lancaster. But Helen, tell me, um, what are you now working on that you can tell people about? Yeah, so next September, I've got a new book out, Spymaster. It's a revised, expanded version of MI6 Spymaster, or SIS. So yeah, spans from the end of the Boer War all the way through to the early Cold War. So he's one of the few oh. intelligence officers that served in three world wars, well, technically world wars, Boer from up until the, the Cold War. So yeah, exciting stuff. And he's he's more the, to memory of John le Carre actually, more the Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy than the James Bond's character, but equally fascinating some very big characters that cross his path so that comes out in september with yale well sounds good i'm going i'm signing up for that one <laughs> good well you've both got autumn books come out and i will i organize an autumn book festival so there we go there's a there's a thought um good um i've had a, a final comment from and finally i know now know that this james holland is the same person who was on the same degree course at university, 1990-93. Well done and thank you. That's from S Stephen Rees. Yeah. yeah, I read I read history at Durham. So, yeah. good. Okay. Listen, thank you all. Thank you, James. Thank you, Helen, for your time. Thank you all for watching. This is obviously a recorded uh, interview as well, so it'll be posted on our YouTube channel tomorrow morning, as were yesterday's and the days before shows were um, are now on YouTube. So. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, James. We're finishing smack on time, especially. Yeah, for perfect. <laughs> well, thank you, Ben, and thank you, Helen, for, um, for, for, for doing this. It's really, really good of you. Much appreciated. No problem. Thank, thank you. you. It's lovely to see you again, both of you. All right. All right. Take care. Look after yourselves. Happy Christmas, everyone. Cheers. See you soon, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.